Hello and welcome to Midweek Connection on May 24th. Coming here from First Presbyterian Church of San Angelo. My name is Pastor Joel. And I'm Pastor Natalie. And we're going to do what we ordinarily do, and that is do our lectionary reading and talk about it a little bit and see what the Lord might have for us today. Let me go ahead and open this in a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the amazing ways that you continue to bless us each and every day. Thank you for giving us your word that we would know um, your wisdom and, and know your direction. I pray, Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would continue to guide us and lead us and direct us in the way that we should go and that as we read your word today that you will be glorified and the community of faith will be built up. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to start this morning with Psalm 99. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him victory. The Lord has made known his victory. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with a lyre, with a lyre and the sound of melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and all those who live in it. Let the floods clap their hands, let the hills sing together for joy at the presence of the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. And Psalm 147, 1 through 11. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. For he is gracious, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcast of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the speed of the runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. Our Hebrew scripture uh, prophetic word to, comes from Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 14 through 25. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Mortal, your kinsfolk, your own kin, your fellow exiles, the whole house of Israel, all of them, are those of whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, They have gone far from the Lord. To us this land is given for a possession. Therefore say, Thus says the Lord God, Though I removed them far away among the nations, and though I scattered them among the countries, yet I have been a sanctuary to them for a little while in the countries where they have gone. Therefore say, Thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples, and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. When they come there, they will remove from it all its detestable things and all its abominations. I will give them one heart and put a new spirit within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh so that they may follow my statutes and keep my ordinances and obey them. Then they shall be my people and I will be their God. But as for those whose heart goes after their detestable things and their abominations, I will bring their deeds upon their own heads, says the Lord God. Then the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them, and the glory of the Lord of Israel was above them. And the glory of the Lord ascended from the middle of the city and stopped on the mountain east of the city. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea, to the exiles. Then the vision that I had, uh, that I had seen left me, and I told the exiles all the things that the Lord has shown me. From Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through 17. This King Melchizedek of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham as he was returning from defeating the kings and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned one-tenth of everything. 
His name in the first place means king of righteousness. Next, he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. See how great he is? Even Abraham, the patriarch, gave him a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to collect tithes from the people, that is, from their kindred, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man, who does not belong to their ancestry, collected tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had received the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by those who are mortal, in the other by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for the people received the law under this priesthood, what further need would have there been to speak of another priest arising according to the order of Melchizedek, rather than one according to the order of Aaron? For when there is a change of the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. Now the one whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe Moses said nothing about priest. It is even more obvious when another priest arises, resembling Melchizedek, one who has become a priest, not through a legal requirement concerning physical descent, but through the power of an indestructible life. For it is attested of him, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Our gospel lesson today comes from Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 24. The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name even the demons submit to us. Jesus said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At that same hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then turning to the disciples, Jesus said to them privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. And back to our psalm, Psalm 9. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. When my enemies turned back, they stumbled and perished before you. For you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne giving righteous judgment. You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. The enemies have vanished in everlasting ruins. Their cities you have rooted out. The very memory of them has perished. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He judges the world with righteousness. He judges the people with equity. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare his deeds among the peoples. For he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Be gracious to me, O Lord. See what I suffer from those who hate me. You are the one who lifts me up from the gates of death, so that I may recount all your praises, and in the gates of daughter Zion rejoice in your deliverance. The nations have sunk in the pit that they made. In the net that they hid has their own foot been caught. The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. 
The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. The wicked shall depart to Sheol, all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor perish forever. Rise up, O Lord, do not let mortals prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are only human. And our final psalm today is Psalm 118. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. With the Lord on my side, I do not fear. What can mortals do to me? The Lord is on my side to help me. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in mortals. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They blazed like a fire of thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die but I shall live, and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God. I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks, thanks be, be to God. God. I think we should start in Hebrews today. Okay. Why not? Why not? Why not? So, Hebrews. So, uh, the whole of Hebrews is really about this idea of the superiority of Jesus compared to everything that has come before. Uh, the writer of Hebrews talks about how God spoke to people through the prophets, how God gave them his word, how God has uh, even sent angels to minister to them. But in all of these things, Jesus is superior. Um, and the rest of the book is the author of Hebrews uh, explaining different ways in which Jesus is superior. So I love this chapter 7 because uh, Melchizedek is this guy who shows up in Genesis. He's, again, as, as Hebrews describes, a guy who just kind of shows up. His name means king of righteousness. He was the king of Salem, which means he's the king of peace. And he interacts with, with Abram when he was about to go and um, fight against all the kings in the valley of, of Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and Abraham rescues his son, Lot, uh, his nephew, Lot. And then when he comes back, he offers a tithe to this priest of the Most High God, this king of, of peace. Um, and then we never hear anything about Melchizedek again, at least in terms of, you know, we see him mentioned in other places of scripture, uh, but he never shows up again. And so what the writer of Hebrews is doing here is explaining how Jesus is in the order of Melchizedek, as in no earthly genealogy, 
uh, who is himself the king of righteousness, who is himself the king of peace, mm-hmm. and one that actually receives from us our worship, receives from us our tithe. Um, and then even this line in here about how uh, from physical descent, Jesus comes from the line of Judah, which was not the priestly tribe, but Levi was the priestly tribe. And so this gets to this point that Judah was then the kingly tribe. Um, and Jesus then is both prophet and priest and king. And so, in, in and again, superior to everything that has come before. I know that's not a uh, exhaustive study on, on Hebrews chapter 7, but that idea of within Jesus, all of the the human offices that God intended for us to, to do, prophet, priest, and king, Jesus is the embodiment all of, of all of those, where humans for a long time, they were sort of subdivided along those lines. Right. Jesus brings them back together. He is superior because he is doing that which we could not do and is able to do it himself. Um, and so it's certainly worth going back and reading from Genesis, those, uh, that chapter where Melchizedek is, is mentioned, and just kind of that mystery of, well, where did he come from? Where did he go? Uh, but Jesus himself is eternal. Just kind of like that, you know, he's always existed uh, and he can be present with us um, even in his physical absence through his spirit himself. Um, let's see. I know that was a lot. Do you have anything okay. to add to that? No, okay, good. great. All right. <laughs> um, and so then going back even to the Luke passage and this again, it's interesting where Jesus had sent out the uh, 70 followers of his at that point and told them to go and to preach the good news. And then it's interesting because it becomes this issue of authority. Mm -hmm. And if Jesus is prophet, priest, and king, he is the embodiment of all of these things. And he talks about how I have given you authority Mm -hmm. to do these things. Um, And I find it fascinating that these are largely untrained people they're followers of jesus he sends them out he says i give you authority and they come back from their mission trip going like oh my gosh did you just see what just happened did you see that we've done amazing things and the power of your name jesus we were able to uh uh even the demons were submitted to us and and if you think about it in terms of a um you know, spiritual authority structure, Mm -hmm. you know, back in the day, people, you know, obviously God at the top of all of the authority and then his angels, but, but even the demons, fallen angels had some power. We see them having power to possess, we Mm -hmm. have power to corrupt, all these kind of things. And so that mere mortals would have authority over uh, spiritual powers Mm -hmm. was, was uh, amazing to them, unbelievable to them. Right. Um, almost too fantastic to even think about. And so what we see happening here is a reestablishment of the proper order of things that God did give humans at the very beginning, the capacity to rule and reign over all of creation, that even the, the angels that become sometimes even adversarial a little bit in other places mm-hmm. of scripture where uh, they put restrictions upon fallen humanity because of their mistakes. Here we are seeing that God's authority given through Jesus to his followers that now the proper authority lines are being reestablished. And so um, it's there's not enough time to play all of this out in this particular place. And again, even for those coming back from their mission trip, it, it didn't even fully make sense to them wow, we have authority. What does that even mean? But Jesus himself is saying that it's not even, that the authority Authority is not even the most important part. Right. It's your name is written in heaven. Right. And so, yes, I give you authority over this, but recognize that's, yeah, there's something bigger at play here. There's something bigger at play. What is it? It's called not only is the proper order being restored, the proper relationships are being yes. restored. That humans now have the capacity to be in the presence of the Lord. That their names are written in the book of life. And and because of that, then, then Jesus goes into... Um, 
that in starting in verse 21 where Jesus rejoicing in the Holy Spirit uh, again we get this Trinitarian description mm -hmm. of what's going on Jesus filled by the Holy Spirit uh, thanking the Father that all of these things were revealed to the people through the Son um, a, the perfect relationship of Trinity Father Son and Holy Spirit but what is again that was, is, is happening that humans are being invited into that right relationship I know we got Pentecost coming up. I know I'm talking too much. You're good. Uh, You're okay. good. Right. I'll right. Guess. All right. I know we got Pentecost coming up. Pentecost, uh, the the remembrance of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon the church, uh, the the disciples themselves being filled by the Holy Spirit to empower them to go out and do the ministry and mission out in the world, continuing to proclaim who Jesus is, continuing to do miraculous signs and wonders uh, with Him. But we're seeing this um, demonstration of power. But, but that itself becomes subservient to the right relationships. Right, and in that relationship, you know, it's um, right there at the end of that verse, 22, you know, who the Father is. Nobody knows who the Son is except you know, all of that. And then, um, and then anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Mm -hmm. And so there is this, as we are in that relationship with Him, that's when this revelation can happen, right. you know. And I tell you, many prophets and kings desired to see what you see, but did not see it, right. or to hear what you hear, but they did not hear it. And it's just like you said, that relationship. And so when we are into, when we enter into that relationship, our eyes, our hearts, our ears, all of those things can be opened up to that fullness, mm -hmm. or that fullness to the capacity that humans can understand. Mm -hmm. right. But right. It, it can be revealed to us. And so um, that relationship um, creates this awareness mm -hmm. and this mm -hmm. openness between um, because relationship leads to revelation. Right, right. And relation, yeah, relation, yeah, absolutely. And revelation leads to relationship. Yeah, all of the thing is all there. The closer we get with God, the more that is revealed to Him, mm -hmm. and then the more that is revealed to Him, the closer we get to God. And right. So it is this ongoing um, relationship. I think that's just really what it boils down to. And 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 as we know, even as humans, our relationships grow and change with each other. Right. The more we know about somebody, um, either the closer we get to them, or the further we get from them, depending on how that relationship. <laughs> Right. is uh, but but with this what we see even with the disciples is that they are getting a glimpse of who Jesus is mm -hmm. and the picture of Jesus becomes more full the more closer they follow him and mm -hmm. and what a great transition even from this end of Luke about how prophets and kings desired to see these things and if we jump back to the Ezekiel passage from Ezekiel 11 uh, we know that Ezekiel was the prophet that spoke to the people in exile. Mm -hmm. That these people had been so disobedient to God, the relationship had been so broken based on the human sin, mm -hmm. you know, their priests not doing the right thing, their kings not doing the right thing, their prophets sometimes even being uh, manipulated by money and stuff. Um, and so they are in exile. They feel as if the relationship has been broken. But right. Ezekiel comes along and says that actually that that God has never broken the relationship, that his glory is not limited to the temple in Jerusalem, that his glory spreads over the entire earth. And ultimately, this symbol of uh, they will be restored to the land. Mm -hmm. And we know that they were restored to the land, but the, the land itself becomes in a way symbolic of a future eternal heavenly place right. that as good as it was to be in the land of Israel and be restored in that place it wasn't the place itself it was the presence of the Lord that mattered and right. so even in the Ezekiel passage he's talking about how the Spirit of God is not limited to a time or a place or even a specific building the temple but extends everywhere so even as they are in exile relationship with God is possible that restoration is possible and and symbolically that they will be restored to the land as important as that is ultimately they will be restored to the eternal land which is uh, being with in the presence of the Lord uh, forever and ever so well and that you see you know I will gather you right. and assemble you that it gives this idea of proximity mm -hmm. and so and like you said I think that's proximity to land but then 
proximity in relationship if we right. look at that from the context of the other um, text that we were looking at right. and so um, there's this when you think about gathering something it's this you know it's pulling too it's you know and so I just uh, verses uh, uh, 18 19 20 um, this idea that it's it is the Lord himself that is going to do heart surgery on us taking out the heart of stone, replacing it with the heart of flesh, uh, the beginning of, of 20, the logical connectors, so that they may follow my statutes and keep my ordinances and obey them. Then they shall be my people and I will be their God. Um, you know, I know that um, I actually have a friend right now who is uh, awaiting a heart transplant. And I'm grateful that we live in an age where we can... Um, have medical technology, medical advances, and the heart failure, physical heart failure that this person is experiencing and is he waiting for a donor. Um, we know that ultimately, physically, we are all going to die, uh, no matter even if they get a new heart and the prayer is that, that he will. Um, but, but death is still wrapped up even within the donation somebody right. else someone, someone has else to had lose. to die mm -hmm. in order for that heart to be used and so even thinking about that from a earthly perspective and how tragedy and new life can be very close right. but here on that very spiritual level uh, who is it that makes it possible for us to follow him in the first place it's the Lord. The Lord is the one who does surgery on our hearts. The Lord is the one who takes the hearts of stone that are cold and hard towards God and replaces them with a heart of flesh. And a heart of flesh ultimately results in um, the, uh, you know, the, the capacity to even do the things that God wants us to do. Uh, okay. And then this whole idea of then uh, they will be my people and then I will be their God uh, again relationship right. brought about by the work of the Holy Spirit hmm. I know I talked a lot today sorry it's okay it was, <laughs> it was good it was good <laughs> Well, uh, did you, and, and I know that when we do our midweek connections on Wednesdays, we often get repeats of the same psalms, but it's interesting how those psalms in connection with other, other texts have a different, they take on a slightly different um, emphasis. Right. You know, last week I remember talking about like the Avenger of Blood and, mm -hmm. and the place of refuge, or maybe that was even two weeks ago. I'm trying to remember, but um, from the, the, the Psalm 9, um, but here we're thinking more along those lines of relationship again and as you were finishing up with the psalm 118 it's better to take refuge in the lord it's right. better than to put your confidence in mortals it's better to take refuge in the lord than to put your confidence in princes and those two verses stuck out to me today because like you said this relationship and then this ezekiel passage recognizing that it is God who is able to change hearts. It right. is the spirit. And it's this weird, like, our hearts have to be open, but they can't be made open if he's not right. there. And so it's it really does fall back onto God. And, and, and with that, that is where we put our refuge. That is where we look. That is where we rest. It's in him because right. he is the one who can do the work that has to be done right we don't take refuge behind walls of stone anymore we take right. you know and even even like the ezekiel passage you know the spirit of the lord is everywhere it's not right. just in a location and how easy it is for us to say yeah this is the place where i find refuge i will run to the city of refuge i will run to jerusalem i will lock myself in the temple and those aren't bad things but right. it's better to take refuge in the presence of the Lord wherever right. you might be. That is be, available. Because it is available wherever you might be. Right. right. Yeah, I thought that was that, that was jumping out to me as we were reading it as well. So, yeah, well, good stuff. Um, uh, again, you know, this this coming Sunday is, is Pentecost Sunday. We're going to have a single service here at church at 1030. Uh, Sunday school for adults. Adults only. Adults only at Sunday school at 915. And uh, wear red if you so desire. It's the, the birthday of the church, the promise of the Holy Spirit to come, uh, who did come and establish uh, the church here on earth. And we 
celebrate this particular day that the Holy Spirit comes upon the church, but we know that that was not just a singular, it was a singular event that had ongoing ramifications as the church more closely follows after the Holy Spirit. It actually enables us and empowers us to do the things that we're supposed to do on an ongoing and regular basis. So come be filled by the Spirit again and afresh on Pentecost Sunday, um, but each and every day ask the Holy Spirit to fill you and, and do those things um, knowing that we have a heart of flesh and not one of stone. So anything else today? Sounds good. All right. Sounds you want good. to close us in prayer? I'd be happy Thanks, to. Thanks, Natalie. Heavenly Father, thank you for your words to us today. Thank you that you do invite us into this relationship and that you uh, are the ultimate um, God who loves us and cares for us, provides us refuge, and that all the power and authority that you give to us, as, as big as that is, it's so much more when we enter into a relationship with you. It's so much more when your goodness and your mercy and your love is revealed to us and that we can draw in closer to you. And in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for reading with me today. I enjoyed it. Appreciate you guys joining us. Take care. Have a great day. Bye-bye.